Hi. Hello to everybody. I'm reminding you again that you have to wear your masks and silence your phones. We're going to begin the second session that deals with the daycare supervision law. The chair is Professor Yossi Shavit, chair of the Taub Center Initiative on Early Childhood Development and Inequality that we have already presented in the previous session. Hello to everybody. We're in the second session that deals with the daycare supervision law in January of this year. The uh, Child uh, Rights Committee of the Knesset, uh, chaired by Dr. Yusuf Jabrin at the time, they authorized the supervision regulations on early childhood frameworks required by the uh, Welfare Ministry. Now, authorizing these regulations allows supervision of private daycare uh, centers and, you know, enforcing specific, very important criteria. They require treatment, the ratio of the number of children to uh, employees, meaning a number of uh, kindergarten uh, teachers that requires education uh, requirements of the staff and requires that they attend continued pedagogical uh, uh, education. Uh, also, the regulations enforce safety and physical uh, requirements on the facility and on the staff, and approving these regulations allowed the enforcement of the daycare supervision law that was enforced, enacted, sorry, I think two years earlier uh, by Knesset members and uh, Minister uh, Karina Larali and uh, and Ms. Shasha Bitton, and it includes the state re responsibility for the staff and the facilities in most, most centers from age zero to three, and the enforcing of the law and the regulations were historical events, in my opinion, for early child care rights in Israel. It's hard to digest that most of the children in this critical age group attend and still attend uh, unsupervised frameworks and that uh, keep on we keep on hearing the headlights of those creating a lot of pain and suffering so this law is supposed to put an end to those horrible stories to enforce supervision and yet there is very clear critique of the many, many compromises that were done along the way to approving these regulations, particularly the finance ministry that did not take on the responsibility for finding the funding for uh, creating the, uh, for the funding to allow these facilities to meet these criteria. And of course, the discussion that will uh, be held very soon after the formal part of the session uh, will address these issues. The session, deals with the supervision law, with the regulations and its impact on service providers, the kids, the parents. Two will uh, begin. The first will be Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf Jabrin, who I mentioned. He's a former Knesset member. He was also chair of the Knesset Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2000. And uh, uh, 13. He's a doctor of law. He's a lecturer in the Tel Chai Academic College, and he uh, has done and continues to deal with the, the uh, Rights Center in Nazareth. Afterwards, we will hear from Achinoam Echananya. Achinoam has is the uh, Democratic uh, uh, Kindergarten uh, uh, um, director in Tel Aviv. She's an educational entrepreneur and led the uh, No Kindergartens, No Routine initiative during the time of COVID and uh, was widely recognized. She's uh, in the Tel Aviv Jaffa uh, Kindergarten Forum intending to improve kindergarten care in the city. Now, after Yusuf and Nachinam speak, and you know that these are two ends of the spectrum of talking about this uh, issue, we will hear from two other uh, uh, debaters to uh, add their opinions. These two are Sima Haddad and Varda Malka. Sima Haddad is the vice chair of the 
uh, the National Council for the Child, who mentioned earlier that in the National Council for the Child, CIMA deals with promoting the rights, safety, and care of early childhood uh, and the welfare, health, and other implications of the care. In the past, CIMA was, <laughs> sorry, CIMA was head of uh, the preschool uh, department in the education ministry that deals with the content and curricula for zero to three uh, in uh, uh, supervised kindergartens. The second is Valda Malka. Valda is director of knowledge and tools development in the uh, daycare uh, department. Uh, she's also the actual director of the education and care department uh, there in the ministry. She deals with uh, promoting all issues of early childhood framework where in academia and in the government. So you understand why it's important for us to bring representation also for the bride and the groom from the Ministry of Labor and from the Ministry of uh, Education. Towards the end of the session, we'll open it up to debate and uh, we'll, for questions. So I am very happy to invite Dr. Jabarin uh, to be the first to speak and of course they'll wave you in with the time uh, doctor so uh, because we have a time limit no just give me a yellow card first before you pull out the red Well, good, uh, good day to everybody, and thank you to the organizers in the Taub Center for this really important uh, conference and uh, for inviting me to speak here. And actually, there's a lot of issues that arise uh, with this topic, and I thought to uh, take my you know few minutes to share with you the legislation process the dilemmas in legislation the problems and uh, sort of less talk about uh, uh, the you know specific maybe issues but maybe we'll have time later for questions and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have time but it's important first of all to say the daycare per supervision law was enacted in 2018. And according to the law, the regulation should have been approved maybe a year later in October 2019, let's say. And it sounds odd. The, the, the law establishes something, but it doesn't actually happen. But actually, it happens a lot where laws are enacted and nothing is enforced. And when I talk on this position of chair of uh, the uh, uh, Child's Rights uh, uh, Committee, I, at the get-go, set a goal to try as much as possible to approve the regulations of the supervision law. Because I was in the Child's Rights Committee when the law was approved. I was part of all of the activity. I understood the importance. I was there at the time. And I wanted to complete our mission. And so I made sure that this, the authority to approve the uh, regulations, which was not uh, very high in the committee, I made sure that it would come to the door of the uh, Knesset committee. And I started to, with my beginning, as a, the onset of my role as chairman and with a lot of help from a lot of good people, some of them right here in this hall today, that uh, turned to me from the academia, from the field, from organizations, and uh, pointed my attention uh, to the issue, to its importance, and to pressure people from the uh, ministries of welfare and finance to, first of all, talk about the regulations, have them approved, because we started the uh, committee and there wasn't any, there weren't any regulations to approve. And then the pressure began, first of all, in the finance ministry and the welfare ministry, but particularly the welfare ministry, because the minister was the per there was supposed to approve the regulations. And of course, we were at the peak of uh, the COVID uh, crisis, uh, which meant that in any case, the childcare frameworks were in a horrible economic crisis because of COVID. Uh, and what happened was that the uh, phrasing of the regulation was brought to the committee one day prior to the decision that was supposed to be raised in the Knesset. 
Now, I have to say, one day prior to a Knesset deliberation, well, we understood that the Knesset is going to disperse. And it wasn't an easy situation to be in because you have to understand what to do. Knesset members, uh, you know, they're, they want to go back to their primaries. It's an uh, election period. Uh, there's, uh, you know, elections around the door. And we have a very short window of time, just a couple of days of grace. Why? Because it's a couple of days. And then after you decide on the, you know, dispersion of the Knesset, then they go in to, they go into their break. And during the break, for the elections, I can't hold meetings without having uh, the approval of the uh, uh, the organizing committee, whatever. But it wasn't easy because it wasn't clear that we would get that approval during an election period. So in any case, it was very difficult. And the first question we had to decide, do we start trying to approve the regulations in a period of a few days or say, you know, we're just sort of... Uh, quitting we're raising our hands because it's not practical right now it's not the time to do it and i made a decision as chair of the committee that i do want to push forward also i was consulting with people from the field and uh, and even at the price that the regulations won't be the ideal ones that we want or need five minutes okay i've been waved in a left or our left? No, a left? Okay. So we made a decision in the committee that we're pushing forward and we're trying. Why try? Because you never know. It's a process. And if it falls into the Knesset break, we won't get approval. It won't happen. And they would do marathon meetings, days and nights, in which we were left the only people in the Knesset building way into the middle of the night. Uh, they almost gave me the keys to the Knesset uh, at midnight so that I could uh, lock up after I leave. And the real difficulty we faced was that the standards that were determined by the welfare uh, ministry were good standards, not maybe the best, not the, but, but uh, certainly uh, satisfactory. But the finance ministry, in fact, both ministries, because uh, because, uh, you know, I, it doesn't, uh, you know, they, neither ministry bought a, a budgetary plan to fund these changes, meaning raising the standards. How do we pay for it? And I'm saying this is a, a legislative judicial question. You bring us these regulations. If we approve them, there'll be new standards, better standards. But who will pay for the better standards? The state, the finance ministry, the welfare ministry, and the answer we got from the uh, attorney general, if there's no specific decision on funding sources, it will just sort of go back to the market, as it were, to the economy. And the result was that the people who will pay the economic price are the uh, owners of kindergarten and daycare centers and the parents, and it's happening in the middle of a COVID crisis. And I said to them, look, we cannot allow a situation where we approve in the committee regulations which will make parents and uh, uh, center uh, owners pay pay. I mean, we've all been parents. We've all found ourselves in these difficult economic times. And during deliberations, uh, uh, dealing with the key issues, as you can imagine, the number of children in every group, the regulations of safety around COVID, the ratio of the number of babies and infants to staff, meaning in the space, the tiny space, physical space, these are all budgetary issues. And at the end, of course, the training regulations, the initial requirement that staff be trained. And I mean, this is a profession to take care of children is a profession, but the ongoing education, so as I said, it came about that there's no budget other than 40 million that on the state decision that through the compulsory, uh, the daycare supervision law, it required uh, a, a budgetary allowance of 280 million, but only per year, 40 million. And so I said, okay, we have 40 million. And it said it's insured for enforcement, for application. Uh, but I said, okay, what are the costs of making all these uh, changes happen? And they said, a quarter they said at least a hundred million to just do the continued education for staff 
four months, uh, four days a, a month. They talked about regulation, standardization. At the end of the day, they talked about at least another 300 million. So we in the committee were in a very problematic situation. Only We only hold 10% of the budget, maybe 10% of the budget, in order to actually make these regulations a reality. What do you do? Either you say, and this is the dilemma that uh, we faced. I mean, we in the committee, activists, parents, uh, professionals. Either we say, look, there's no budget. We can't approve uh, these regulations, take them back until there's a budget. Or we try still to find some source of funding, approve what we can in terms of the regulation while trying to create whatever compromises we can. And we chose, uh, I, this was my stance, that we start working on the regulations uh, in very intensely and approving kind of a, a formula that doesn't raise a lot of costs and fees for a, a kindergarten a, and, or, and uh, kindergarten uh, owners uh, and uh, and parents, but still raise standards. Can we? And I'm saying all this because I assume there'll be a discussion later. Is it possible to find this formula? I say modestly, there was a need for many skills of compromising, uh, bridging balancing i happen to be you know a, a law specialist and i used my law background in order to try my mediation uh, techniques and so the compromise that was finally approved or that was submitted for approval were a lowered standard that those initially provided by the welfare ministry and the regulations in order not to not raise the cost substantially by hundreds of millions that will be enforced on uh, the uh, uh, the uh, facilities and the parents, but also, but to include, yes, certain principles that will create some kind of normative standard. First of all, uh, to do it gradually, to do it uh, in an incremental way. And second, to uh, uh, require that the welfare ministry readdress the matter uh, specifically the regulations within a year and a half and the other matters within three years and basically to provide a report and submit a report on the possibility of uh, uh, mandating specific regulations higher standards uh, and also to consider of course the financial issues at hand and that's what happened at the end of the day a gradual implementation of newer standards and in regards to the lesser standards that we did accept, and such, such as the, one of the key issues of regulations that were under dispute, we finally approved uh, that uh, uh, one child above the required recommended ratio uh, by the in the recommendations. Uh, but we did manage to create an article that within a year and a half, the commissioner basically will examine the possibilities in order to uh, to reduce that one extra child from the uh, staff to child ratio and go back to the initial recommendations provided by the welfare ministry. And I think uh, on the 4th of January, the uh, these regulations were approved by committee. I must admit that since then there were elections and so forth, so I didn't really track what's happening in the field. This is an opportunity to see what's actually happening and also to hear. But I will conclude by saying that first of all, the fact that the regulations were submitted without having a, an insured budget was a problem. And uh, I think uh, showed about the disrespect, lack of true respect, particularly from the finance ministry to the importance of this issue. I mean, to child, you know, children are our future, as they say. And second, the issue is why did I still insist on uh, some kind of regulations, even with the delay of a year, and even though I had compromised on content, and I will conclude by uh, saying, <laughs> because the reality that I was facing in the discussions in the committee, the reality within the, particularly the private frameworks was a real problem. I'm talking to people in the welfare ministry and the finance ministry and people in municipalities. How many uh, frameworks do you have? How many centers? They never had data on what's actually happening in on the ground. 
real data, meaning as if daycare centers are invisible and nobody's looking at them, nobody knows. So in this an extreme situation that we face, that I didn't realize prior, that 60, 70 percent of frameworks are not known by the municipalities, are not recognized, not known by the state, not registered. I never knew that in the beginning of the 21st century, children go and attend frameworks and these frameworks are something that nobody regulates, nobody supervises, not in municipality, not by the state. Nobody even knows about them, that this they even exists. So in this very difficult state of affairs, I thought that it would be better to approve some regulations, even if they're lesser regulations, but at least to begin to start addressing this issue. And I hope that we made the right decision. Thank you very much. There's so much work done in the organizations and parent associations and in the, in the committees and ministries. So I really have to say now, thank you everyone for your hard work. Thank you for all involved. Yes. Um, with your respect, I'll talk in the mic because I don't like standing behind the podium. This is nice. And before I uh, introduce myself, a year and a half ago, I was in a conference of the, the Taub Center initiative and uh, about, and uh, I said, what about early childhood? And they looked at me as if I'm an alien from outer space. And now we're talking just about early childhood. So it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to present myself. My name is Achenoam, and I'm an activist, an educational entrepreneur. But more than anything, I own a kindergarten, a private uh, kindergarten, a democratic kindergarten in Tel Aviv. And I'm a person in the field. I I come home every day from sand with sand in my sandals. I take care of kids and I want to talk about the daycare supervision law from us, from our point of view, from the kindergarten teacher perspective, because uh, everything that's because it's not represented in everyone now. And even during the lunch break, we help with the kids. Uh, we help kids with the lunch. We talk about we do educational activities. But I want to talk about the real, you know, field perspective and talk about what it means to have a private kindergarten. I don't know if you all understand this, but uh, managing a private kindergarten is a very difficult job. I've been doing it for 12 years. It's very demanding and we deal with a lot of difficulties, challenges. I can't talk about them all. I have 10 minutes, but I chose to talk about two major challenges that are, we've already been mentioned that really deal with the supervision law directly. First of all, the real shortage of uh, uh, staff, particularly quality staff, meaning we don't have workers. Just to tell you what that means. If I meet an educator that's not doing a good job, I don't have the freedom to fire her, find somebody else, replace her, because that means that it will be instability to my kindergarten and this, the, I don't have a budget. You talked about this, we talked about funding, we'll talk about that as well, but it has to understand that a private kindergarten where most kids in Israel are in private daycare at this age are funded by a private person, me. I am the kindergarten owner, I am the funder, I'm the owner, I'm the proprietor, all the money that comes in, comes out is my pocket. We have economists and researchers here. Education is expensive. And kindergartens in Tel Aviv, even that take a high tuition fee, are dying. Make it uh, can't make everything. You know the the income that we'd like to make. We'd like to make a higher income, but that's impossible. Now why? Now why would I like talk about these two issues? I must say that after I uh, read the daycare supervision uh, regulations, the situation today is better. There's a lot of kindergartens that do meet much higher standards today than in the past. My colleagues that are also kindergarten owners and we're part of very serious education forums and associations, we meet international standards. But at the end of the day, most of the kindergartens don't meet these standards. Not everybody does. And the more that there are regulations and enforcement of regulations, we may create, a, 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 we may sort of block the funnel. 
we will on the one hand raise uh, the levels of standards and regulations and we want to raise quality but we won't create side of quality because we may create side effects that block that progress that we're not considering and that's what we need to consider right now i can't talk about them all but two major obstacles the first that uh, is the professional training of staff because one of the requirements of the regulations is that kindergarten teachers must undergo 150 hour course the most basic one and there are others continued education programs safety that's three days uh, four hours each pedagogical uh, education and kindergartens that meet these high standards are already doing this and most kindergarten teachers in my kindergarten and in many others do do this but the most of the majority do not meaning they do not have this basic uh, training, not even the most basic training. And what can happen? I don't know if you're aware, but we in a private kindergarten care, we work about nine hours a day, maybe more physical work, uh, difficult work, personal work. I don't know if any of you lately has come home, uh, you know, come to work at seven, finished at seven after they uh, helped children bent over a million times, change diapers. So we create a great burden because we're continuing more hours of study over nine hours of work. And this creates erosion. The uh, day in a daycare is very long and the hours are very long and the year is very long. We end in the middle of August, very few time or days off. And what happens is because so many of the people, the educators who work in kindergartens and private kindergarten care have been there for years, it's not sure that they will be willing to go to education. They'll do it very superficially and it won't be the quality education that we want. It will be just done, you know, because people are required and going through the motions. We talked about quality. Quality not is not to have a diploma, but to really get your education and absorb it. Another example has to, and you mentioned this already, it, and was mentioned, uh, the structural uh, changes that are required in the facilities themselves. Most private kindergartens are in private buildings, uh, not public buildings. It means that we pay a lot, a lot, a lot of rent and facility maintenance. And now we'll have to change structurally. There's uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, um, aberrant uh, use uh, regulations that are uh, uh, fees that are required by the municipalities and now structural changes that will be required. And this may cause additional problems. We talked about this earlier to raise the fees of tuition for parents, because this is a big problem already. Quality daycare costs a lot of money to parents. And this means that it's more money for parents. Another thing that may happen is that I will have to more spend more as the proprietor. I'll have to cut off something else meaning we don't want to cut, for example, the wages of our kindergarten staff. That's the most important thing I have, my staff, quality staff that, that will not continue to work at very low wages and our budget is already limited. And another thing that may happen is people who go and, stop and quit the profession altogether. They don't want to get into the profession. The people who close kindergartens, I've already known business owners to have, they say they can't deal with the changes it's a personal sacrifice, it really is, because private kindergarten owners really take on a great financial risk. You can do it. It can be done. There are, as I said, kindergarten is that do it already and do it at the highest standards uh, that uh, you can imagine. But I think that there are all sorts of proposals here that we're showing you that always talk about funding and subsidizing. Obviously, funding is uh, essential either a funding that's direct to the kindergartens or funding through providing the continued education to increase education of uh, staff. Uh, we'll talk about employment incentives maybe in the uh, debate, but I want to bring one example that's not necessarily a budget related one. To change how uh, educators are viewed, we have to understand that the key problem, at least to me, in these regulations is that there's a stick but no carrot they want us to raise the level they want us to increase investment and raise quality 
but they're not changing the attitude towards us. If you want the kindergarten teacher that get there every day at 7 a.m. to be real educators, to be skilled, to continue to educate themselves, to really take education seriously in such an important age group, then we have to also shorten their day of work. We have to increase their edu education possibilities. If they want kindergarten teachers to meet the standards of the ministry, then let's address these educators for what they are and with the respect they deserve. And finally, I'll show you my kindergarten. In the panel earlier, they talked about uh, this day of research and talking about research, and that's very important. But research is not just dry ink on paper. At the end of the day, there's a teacher and a kid being hugged and because the kid is crying because they didn't get a toy they wanted. And there's actually a professional mediation being carried on out moment to moment between that grown up and that child. And we have to think about those educators and those children. That's the key vulnerable point, the weak point of this law, in my opinion. We talked about they talked about in the panel nobody talked about the field people the people the people who manage uh, kindergartens who do it every day there are people that are uh, being inspired by models in other uh, countries in the world they're raising their standards and you can ask them how do you do it how do you encourage your staff to be real educators to give quality education we would like to talk to you there's maya and elia and others who are private kindergarten owners in Tel Aviv like me, and they have great kindergartens. We would love to hear from their experience. We would like to share because we're sure that everybody here knows, everybody agrees that everybody in Israel, every child deserves to get great quality care and to become great citizens. So talk to us. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and I'm also moved and excited. I did not prepare any presentation, any PowerPoint presentation, so you'll hear me without it. And I have so much to say. Whatever we manage to cover, we will. First of all, Achinoam. It's a new spirit, and I totally, totally agree with you. We need to take into account the private sector, which in my view, we're talking extensively today about 24% of the daycare centers that are supervised, but most of the children are in facilities that so far have not been uh, supervised, but they don't necessarily do a bad job. It's hard for me to hear time and time again, people talking about the non-supervised uh, daycare centers as having more violence. This one thing has got nothing to do with the other. Of course, when there's more supervision, there are a lot more possibilities, but let's bear in mind, uh, even according to what we heard this morning, that we have more children, more families, more parents who give trust to the private sector more so than to the uh, supervised uh, uh, system, maybe because of lack of uh, you know, room for their children, but definitely this is the reality. If we look at what is happening in this country, then children in early childhood facilities are in frameworks. I disagree with much of the data that was mentioned here in the previous session. The highest percentage is to be found within frameworks and a smaller one is in the care of caregivers and even a smaller percentage in the care of parents. That's just a general comment, and I'd like to say to Achinoam that in the framework of the council, and I will say a word about what's happening there, yes, we included in our uh, committees, and perhaps, Nomi, we should uh, revisit the whole thing to see how we can include more. With your permission, I'd like to say a few words about the Early Childhood Council that is the result of a law that was passed. And even laws uh, somehow dissipate with time. And I think that thanks to so many people present here, this law was enacted. Perhaps it's not the best law. We've had two 
rough years like all of you and we had four ministers of education no state budget and still we insisted on holding some sort of an order to actually abide by the law uh, by the written word and the first things uh that were said is that the aim of this law is to optimize the early childhood education in the state of israel uh, i'd like to talk not about a closed funnel, but an open funnel that integrates the work of all agencies and ministries in uh, health, education, and welfare. Uh, the council has 10 roles and five components to be the national program for three to five-year-olds, working with local government, uh, social organizations, and foundations in order to pull resources. We know that in the state of Israel, so many organizations are to be found in the early childhood uh, systems, but one doesn't know enough about the other. Uh, the place of local government, we believe that the way to work with local government uh, um, I think that COVID proved to us that the local government has the ability, the strength, and the capability to ignite uh, processes that can better the situation uh, for toddlers. And also uh, the, e the professional training, which is a part of our mandate. This day is totally devoted to one topic, and that's um, treatment education uh, frameworks. The council does not only treat these frameworks, it designed a national program that says that in order to um, better the situation of the child, we have to tackle three main challenges. We talk about parents, families. You asked uh, about the place of uh, parents in the education of their children. To what extent is this part significant? So parents and families have a significant role, starting uh, from training uh, uh, parents, uh, the baby clinics, uh, returning from maternity leaves. All those are included in our national program, and we'll soon say a word about the budget. The second uh, circle deals with uh, community, the place of the local government. We do believe that the educational perception, uh, not just the educational, uh, has to be done on a micro level within the local authority. I will soon say a word about that. But as soon as the local authority has enough data on all children from day one, uh, I believe that even in an older age, you know, when you have the national program and you see the uh, continuum, uh, Perhaps we realize that not enough is being done on children on the spectrum, for example. And I would be very happy if every meeting that we have from this day on will view things in a very comprehensive way. Even parts within the regulations are inseparable. It's true that uh, treatment education uh, setups, even budgeted by the state, require the highest budget. I believe it's 60% of the budget, even if we know that the investment in children is low. Still, 60% of the budget is for treatment education facilities. I believe uh, it's both the parents and family and the community, and we'd like to change that. And this should be done uh, with the help of a ministerial committee for early childhood. We believe that as soon as this committee would be set up, and I'm full of hope that the Minister of Education, Dr. Ifat Shasha Biton, will advance this topic uh, to the credit of the previous uh, minister. I can say that he declared this but we had another election, and I do hope that this time will succeed. When it comes to regulations, I so agreed with what you said concerning what one chooses. Is it a decision not to abide by the regulations and make any progress, or perhaps to put the foot in the door and start? And this inherent tension is always found in the place that we want to see the highest bar. We know that 
everyone is reciting this and sometimes we're tired of hearing how important it is to treat those uh, toddlers uh, when it comes to risk factors. I'm not, you know, preaching to the choir at the moment, but because we know that these three years are critical for the development of brains and also the future lives of children, we should do more to invest in these ages the maximum we can. Be, and I won't go into the wars of the Ministry of Finance uh, and anyone else. Only those working in a governmental uh, ministry know what that means. But I have to say that we should continue uh, to voice this message. First of all, we should congratulate and commend the processes that we've gone through in the last few years. And the age used to be five or six, and it went down to five, and then we went down to three, and we saw what happened to the system. Our test right now is not free education. I don't know. That means a lot of money, but I think that there are so many other things that we can still do. We're talking about the supervision regulations. I won't go into the nitty gritty of regulation, but I will say that children who are spending eight or nine hours in any educational framework have to have a person who is an expert on early childhood, just a sec, who knows what he's doing or she's doing, that he's, you know, has received the uh, training, and I'm sure Achinam would agree with me. I do agree that we need to find the proper funding for this, uh, even in the private uh, daycare centers, but because the fact is that uh, in the free education for three-year-olds, uh, the uh, funding was found. So training is not only training. People talked about the definition of a profession. There's no such definition, not for caregivers, not for assistants. Everyone who has an ID card can work in this framework. And the ones who uh, survive there definitely deserve an applause. You heard, this is very uh, tiring, uh, wearing out job. So the most important thing is the definition and the training quality is being measured by training and the definition of the profession. One last uh, uh, word about standardization. And of course, quality relates to standardization and an educational environment. All that costs money, of course. And our task is to see what are the sources of funding that can be mobilized? I'm not talking about such a complex year as this one, uh, but I would like to see that we continue to mark the, 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 the threshold requirements for early childhood, the screening of manpower, even if it is going to be difficult in the first three years. And it's true, we have a shortage of uh, employees even today, but we should not give up on the components of quality in their entirety, namely training, definition of the profession, standardization, and educational environment for all. Thank you very much and good luck to you all. Hello, everyone. I thought that the panel starts earlier. First of all, thank you uh, to the venue, the Taub Center that hosts this important uh, conference. I heard Dr. Sasha Boel and I followed all the discussions of the committee until the passing of the principles of the law, which were done in a very uh, admirable way. And I do agree with this foot in the door that the, the very fact that this is not enough and it can be improved further and we've not yet reached the goal that we would like to reach, still there's a breakthrough and it allows us to continue and move forward with all the standardization and the increase of uh, the quality of education treatment. We in the daycare center department started working uh, on the implementation of the law and in the panel, I'll respond to the questions I'm asked while placing the emphasis on training, 
and coaching. And I do think that early childhood, indeed, I do believe that early childhood is on the map and it's excellent that it is so. There's so many uh, stakeholders, so many people who show interest in early childhood as it pertains to each and every one of us, uh, one way or another, be it our child or a child in the family or of relatives. And I actually prepared a PowerPoint presentation, but I understand that while being asked, I'll be able to relate to the questions as well as what Noah Achinoam said, and also give my own take on things. So thank you very much to you all. Can I only say something about a certain component that I forgot? Uh, the whole idea of training the uh, support system and the uh, mentoring of educational uh, teams and the children in that, uh, you know, uh, framework, because early uh, detection saves a lot of money later on. So this is the stage where we invite the uh, uh, audience to participate in the discussion. I have to say, I have to share something with you, a certain feeling of mine. Some of you must have followed, just like me, the uh, media discourse around the approval of the regulations in the committee uh, this last January. And the discourse was extremely critical when it comes to the uh, regulations. We heard so much criticism against the Ministry of Finance because of lack of willingness to budget, the various compromises made by the committee concerning another child, one more child or one less child, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The silencing of the regulations when it comes to trivial, uh, ostensibly trivial uh, aspects, uh, the training, etc. I remember this as if it happened today. And now I notice that in this forum, which is very much representative of all stakeholders, the atmosphere, I believe, changed. And I wonder if that would happen even in this discussion that we're about to open now. Yes, so who would like Who's uh, handing over the mics? Please introduce yourself and say a word or two about who you are. I suggest that we don't wait for the microphone. Please speak up. Hello, I'm Yara Shilo, of the leaders of Chinuch uh, Melada, education since uh, birth. I sat on other committees of the regulations of the law. I was one of those who were uh, most criticized. And I have not exactly a question, but something that should uh, provoke some thinking uh, from everyone here. Uh, for the first time, uh, the discussion focuses on employment, employment, employment. And I wish to see us talking about the rights of children, just like what Nomi said at the end of the session, she uh, brought it to the stage. I believe that we should discuss this more. And I turn to Achinoam and I say, I, I, I would like to tell you that what you're talking about is a, a privilege, because if you walk around in the state of Israel, so the weaker populations are more marginal than the early childhood uh, is, and let alone migrant laborers. Or So if you walk around the southern part of Tel Aviv and you'll see the weaker populations, you can see that this would never, never happen. And unless we wish to see some standardization for children, it doesn't matter who's going to fund it, whether it's the parents or the state, but there has to be one responsible adult in this country that would look children in the eye and remember that they have the right to be not transparent, to be existent. And, and this is what drives me because, you know, I've grown tired a long time ago. When we talk, we have to remember well, how privileged we are in what we can offer our children, the kind of frameworks. For example, uh, I can ask uh, what education you have. 
Just look at other people and see the kind of education they have. I'm only trying to understand. I truly appreciate what you do. I'm trying to understand what the question is. We are fighting for you, I believe. When they're not talking to the mic, it's hard to hear. If all of us uh, go on strike, they will find someone else to do the job. First of all, I look at children in the eye for 12 years. I know exactly what their rights are, perhaps more than many people who are sitting here. I'm sorry for being so critical. I am not against the regulations, quite the contrary. I think that with respect to the situation that we're in, these regulations are relatively accessible, implementable in most uh, daycare centers, and they are the very basic. But I'm here to represent what, in my view, you talked about a privilege. I have the privilege to meet all those standards, unequivocally so. I live in the center of Tel Aviv. The parents in my kindergarten can pay the amount of money uh, for tuition. I do understand that in the peripheries and in the weaker areas, what will happen is that many of these families uh, that uh, work, they're not the same ones as those working in my kindergarten because uh, they won't be able to be harnessed. As a person uh, who works in education, I believe in children's rights. I want to be a part, children to be a part of the community of kindergarten and the state. I have to give them the sense that they belong, that they are partners, that we have a dialogue between us. And this is what I try to talk about. If you want to take the uh, uh, educators, uh, who do not come from privileged areas, if you want to uh, mobilize them to meet these basic standards, that we need to give them the sense that they belong, that they are uh, worthy and valuable. Unless we do this, uh, other things will happen. The laws and the regulations would not bring uh, any uh, added value. I'd be very happy what uh, education uh, I have and the rest of my staff. I'd like to maybe uh, sharpen Yara's uh, comment. The question she raises is whether standardization that is embodied in the regulations, and we're fully aware of the low level of standards, does it serve the uh, interest of equalizing opportunities among different uh, groups in the population? Can any one of the panelists relate to this point? I'd like to relate and also answer your question, Achinoam. Actually, the regulator in charge of implementing the regulations is the Ministry of uh, Labor and Welfare, the daycare department. Now, in order to make accessible the whole idea of training, First of all, we held round tables and consulted with field people. And that's a very important point that you raised. When you talk about round tables, first of all, the uh, directors of daycare centers should be present. And we consulted with private um, daycare centers and also the subsidized uh, daycare centers. and the educational counselors and representatives of different organizations, various stakeholders, representatives of the academia and colleges for teaching and education. And we wanted to make these courses in the most accessible way that would appeal to everyone and achieve the goal for which we are demanding the uh, increase in quality of any caregiver so that when they go to the kindergarten, they'll know why they're here, why they're here and what they should do in order to up their quality. A training program was developed by representatives of the academia after consulting with all the relevant entities. And moreover, I'm very happy to tell you, Dr. Jabarin, that we are now working together with uh, Digital Israel and the Vocational Training uh, Council to develop an online uh, course for a uh, uh, an educator uh, who's also in, uh, who's working in the treatment educational uh, framework. We said that this will happen with you or without you. Please join us because that's what the field needs. 
So this course will be uh, launched in October. People of the academia, now tell me, thank you for convincing us. It will be obviously free of charge. Some of the hours that will be done frontally will indeed be frontal classes. And I believe that this course will achieve its goal, even though the hours are very few and it's really the most basic. We wanted to get 670 hours, but we didn't get it. But as a person who was present in all the discussions behind the scenes in the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Education, and people talked about those battles. And indeed, these are battles battles. You know, every uh, hour that was achieved uh, was a real win. Uh, Yara was also with us. So you know what it means and what battles need to be fought to achieve anything. We do look at reality and we want to increase the education quality, but you have to pull both sides in order to make the best for the children. Sima, please. I think that first and foremost, we have to look at the rights of children, and this is why we have the frameworks of treatment and education. Achinoa must agree as well, I believe, that she would want to have a staff that is skillful and professional and knows what they're doing with the children. Perhaps the characteristic of uh, the prevalent characteristic of Achinoam's daycare center is not typical of all others. This is one of the key areas that needs to be tackled. It's the quality of uh, women power. This is a very major task uh, because it would make people uh, flee the scene, but you can find different tracks for people who worked in the past, perhaps shorten the time span required for the training uh, we have uh, experience uh, with private uh, systems and public systems. You will hardly find any uh, kindergarten teachers that don't have a BA. So you have to say, notice what we do, but we do believe in uh, quality for the benefit of children. Of course, for quality, you need to have the conditions for it. Thank you. Actually, Varda, who is the representative of the office, talks about battles. And just imagine the discussions within the uh, Children's Rights Committee when members of Knesset from the opposition and the Meshutefet have to fight, you know, the wars of different government ministries. So that was not easy at all. I have to say that, of course, I truly appreciated the wish and the professional contribution of your department, Varda. And I also understood that you failed to secure the required budgets. I, of course, from my perspective, see that this is the responsibility of both ministries, but it's also uh, under the more direct, uh, you know, responsibility of the Ministry of Finance. But the challenge today is definitely that of implementation, to approach the professional implementation work while, and that's a topic that really came up in the discussions, to increase the issue of supervision and the legislation and licensing of those daycare centers. Because the situation that prevails today, and you heard this from the speakers, most frameworks are not supervised. And I think that we should say that still, they're not even recognized uh, uh, by the uh, local authorities. This is incomprehensible. Uh, it, what needs to be done does not necessitate too big budgets to approach the local authority. And this is what we wanted from the Ministry of Labor and Welfare, to simply ask every local government to do its own field work. And for there to be registration, at least that, what's so difficult about that? So that every local authority would know exactly what uh, frameworks operate within its boundaries. And then it's going to be synchronized. This information will be synchronized with the Ministry of Labor and Welfare, and then gradually we'll reach the situation that instead of 
having a non-supervised field uh, or for the majority uh, cases, now it would only remain a minority case. But it requires a diligent work and collaboration between all agencies, but it's definitely possible. And this will bring us to better equality, because if you start implementing the regulations, but you don't have the open eye that uh, supervises all frameworks, then I'm afraid that this would be a pirate uh, you know, markets that would include thousands of frameworks that operate with no supervision. And what you said is true. You have to notice that actually, if we only if we make things uh, too hard, then we'll this will be counterproductive. It requires a lot of work of supervision. And by the way, I'd like to say concerning the online course, there was a requirement, a demand that came up. I wanted a course in Arabic as well. And if you remember, there were members of Knesset who said maybe in Russian too, and we were very open and we did the first accommodation. And I do hope that that would be translated to work in the field. Definitely, we relate to the translation into Arabic as well. I didn't uh, use my PowerPoint presentation and I will just give you a further update on a number of important issues resulting from the implementation of those regulations. So beside the courses that will be given in different languages as uh, required by the regulations, the department decided last week to start a developmental educational uh, program, education and treatment in early childhood. And Ms. Michal Carmel initiated this program, so she definitely deserves uh, the credit for it. This program actually deals with every aspect of uh, toddlers and babies' development from uh, birth till the age of five almost. And this book will be also translated into Arabic. We did not commit to this in the regulations, but of course we will translate this and it uh, you know, includes the curriculum, the uh, daily program, and any owner of any kindergarten would know how to operate according to it. I'd also like to update you on the educational uh, counselor or instructor. Uh, he, it came up from all committees that uh, were held even before the uh, law was enacted that the uh, mentoring and the training is very important the maintenance of the educational staff and the increasing uh, of its you know uh, quality education so when the question came up uh, concerning who would be that instructor, members of Knesset agreed with the fact that this educational instruction would have an, a, a graduate degree in education for uh, early childhood. But the bar went down and instructors with only 10 years of experience were allowed in. The regulations were not uh, enforced, so we have to actually regulate it and as an interim stage to submit uh, our own proposal uh, and recommendation. We held roundtable discussions with all the relevant professionals, field people, all the way up to the academia, and this week we published uh, the draft. Uh, uh, concerning who is an educational instructor while paying attention to everything that requires attention and looking at what is happening in the field. Uh, those of you who are interested, I'd be very happy to send it to you. You can submit comments uh, and then we will have the supervisor's recommendation and that would encourage uh, those who want to have an instructor would receive uh, budgeting and subsidy for this task. And when we get to the legislation, everyone would be committed to hiring only those who meet the criteria for an educational uh, in supervisor. Yael and Tal. So there would be a list of licensed educational instructors. I'm told that we only have five minutes, so please speak fast. Following what Yara brought up and following what Achinam said, that kindergarten, 
daycare centers would be closed. We all talk about the rights of children and how important it is. How can we help children who are in these weak populations in the Arab sector, in the Negev, uh, migrant laborers? How do we help those children to have the right to receive this minimal something? And there you cannot possibly enforce the regulations. Who would like to relate to this question? I'm sorry, but I have to keep to the time very meticulously because I'm being pressured. I'm willing to say that I, in those weaker areas, what will actually happen is that frameworks would be open, but not the legal ones. And that's the biggest fear. They would not meet the standards. I can say that the uh, stronger uh, frameworks, and I'm saying this uh, after moving from the uh, recognized, which is unofficial, and the official ones, uh, if we only deal with a higher subsidy, uh, tax brackets, we have to think about the topic in a much more wider way, uh, not to just come up with one solution. Definitely, you know, subsidization is critical, and we have to treat this differently. Even when they talked about the accessibility of frameworks in the previous session, we have to bear in mind that the past year and a half taught us that I'm not sure we need, uh, a day, you know, frameworks for the entire day. Perhaps we only need them for a few hours in certain days. So we have to discuss this and see who is most influenced by it. I can only regret one thing, and that is that during the writing of these regulations, uh, two central committees were not taken into account who have already worked on improving the standards. I won't discuss them because I know who I'm talking about, the Rosenthal uh, Committee and also the Trachtenberg Committee, the one who truly uh, entered the depth of their work, uh, can see the foundations. Had the regulations been based on it, things would have been better. It's finally the Ministry of Finance that did the work, and it was definitely up to all working together. Just a, a very brief uh, comment. Uh, the regulations and the compilation of uh, regulations sounds like good. Uh, we're not the only country who did this. We have other countries who actually did such a thing and we can look and see what they did. We shouldn't, you know, reinvent the wheel. Okay, just as a word concerning other countries, by the way, there's a very explicit uh, reference made to the OECD countries as a model that we should aspire to, but let's only bear in mind that we do have a new government. The Minister of Education uh, was the chairperson of the Committee of Rights of Children that approved the supervision law and supported the regulations. Perhaps the time has come to shift gears in the requirements as well. Don't forget the worthy framework that we discussed in the committees, free education in these ages to all these uh, ages of uh, zero to three contributes to social gaps, strengthens the social gaps, mostly in the periphery. So this aspiration has to be uh, uh, emphasized that it should be free and mandatory to all. And we didn't talk about transferring it to the Ministry of Education so that there is an educational continuum from birth to higher education. So uh, Minister of uh, Health wanted to bring back higher education because of the continuum. Edu but what about birth to age three? Then it's also an integral part, perhaps even more decisive in the development of children. I would like to ask you to give me another three minutes because I'm not being given this. Talinir from Good Eyes headquarters. I want to be the party pooper and say a word about the uh, future. I was very much against 
I think that the strategic most proper option was not to pass the regulations because to demand all that you want now would have been better had there been no regulations and everyone's rage together would have been channeled toward the new government and we could ask them all that we want and receive the budget in a lot more forceful way and not to you know legalize this lame creature i'd like to say that let's not make another mistake let's not compromise in such a horrific way that comes at the expense of everyone's children's rights i'd like to say another important point concerning what achinoam raised here and others I believe that the quality of treatment is the most important thing because we don't want to reach situations that, God forbid, in this age, which is the most important in the individual's uh, development, children would be uh, harmed and damaged. This is why we have to uh, invest in trainings and uh, design training and mediate it to the staff and to take those trainings at the expense of their working time and not to demand extra time. Uh, we believe that this is possible with not too high figures, uh, maybe within the 200 million shekels that the Ministry of Education uh, received uh, to allow for these trainings and educational uh, courses, because these are the things that have to be invested in first. Thank you, Tal. If we didn't have any regulations, we could demand more. I'd like to allow SD to say the last word before the panel uh, respond to the last two comments. There's a lot of energy in the room and it's good, but I do hope that you can hear me. I'm SD from the Barlan University. We wrote the curriculum for the developmental uh, program supported by Dr. Michal Carmel, but the nice book is ours. A lot of work, uh, three years of work to write it, and we still have additions. Thank you. Word for the threshold training? No, the 150 hours was different. The developmental uh, program, we are involved in the 150 hours out of the 150 or 96 uh, are online. That's 54 hours frontal and that's the minimum. So that's what we do. We're trying to work with the field people. Uh, it's very, very important to us. When it comes to quality, I believe that the training is one of the solutions and that's the solution that the law opts for because it does allow for hours. We think that 10 hours are the minimum or 12 hours. There are private uh, frameworks, Achinom. I don't know how much training you give, but this is the first tool to increase quality. The caregivers and their education and the directors of uh, daycare centers and their education are extremely important. We're at the very bottom in the OECD countries. We're, we have a major gap when compared to all other OECD countries, but I wanted to raise another point that was never raised at all, and it's important, and that's the wages of caregivers. It is impossible to pass the uh, discussion of quality. It's true that when you conduct a study in the OECD countries, the wages is not the first thing, but the wages in Israel are so low for all caregivers that you have to say a word about that. So wages and conditions, these two elements were not uh, discussed. I'd like to say that you came late. I came late, that's true. So it's not just wages, it's the working conditions. So in all the committees, nobody said a word about this and definitely it deserves uh, some reference and I'm sorry for being late. Okay. Responses to the last two points. One concerning Tali's position that there was room to strategically operate differently and to dictate on the topic of wages as well. Actually, Tali was a partner to the discussions, of course, and also expressed her opinion in the discussions that took place. It wasn't the uh, average, the majority's opinion 
when it comes to the participation of the field. And I'm saying that the most important thing is that I was not convinced. So to this very day, I think that we did the right thing under the circumstances that prevailed back then. And finally, uh, we used to work together in the past as a lawyer who I was a lawyer who deals with social change. I still cannot see how we'd be better off today. In the meantime, we did put our foot in the door. And when I say we started, obviously not uh, what I'm saying, we started, I'm talking about people who care about the subject. And it's important to say, and I opened my words by saying it, that the preliminary situation that we started with was so dire. Uh, I told you, I believe Sima said that 25% of all frameworks are recognized and supervised. Do you understand how difficult the situation is to transfer from a situation of 25 to the most optimal situation the way we all wanted, ostensibly at this point was not feasible. And then, and then the compromise was to advance and make progress and reach more frameworks and to recognize more of the existing ones, but to also uh, leave the uh, desired state within the regulations. We left the, the proper regulations written so that after a year and a half, we will have to revisit it again and bring it for approval. I do hope that we have a new government and I do hope that it would last and at least do this thing. I have to, I'm told that I have to close a shop. So I suggest that we'll continue the discussion after officially we adjourn. We have a few minutes break. I'm sorry, we cannot hear the comment from the audience as it's not spoken to the mic, so I apologize, but I cannot interpret it. I'd like to respond, even though it's not my field, uh, it's a teacher's department that should respond, but I can say from what I know that the department submitted a program something has not been uh, approved. I believe uh, they, they are referring to the translation into Arabic of the law or the regulations, but this is definitely within our responsibility. I don't know about the publication in Arabic. Perhaps the entire publication that was prepared has uh, already uh, translation into Arabic. I definitely, I definitely would transfer this to, uh, I think the key uh, challenge, this is a very important topic because if people do not receive uh, the necessary information, so the law, the regulations, and I believe in addition to this, we need numbers. We translated the uh, summary of regulations. I'm sorry again, but we cannot hear the speaker. There, are, they have various interpolations from the audience, and there's no way we can hear what they're saying. I'm sorry. Okay, guys.
Okay. Okay, let's applaud the panelists. I do apologize that we have to cut this short when it becomes so interesting, but we can carry on talking while having lunch. Thank you. Thank you. And now we shall take a lunch break. Uh, we have a dairy meal in the lobby of Mishkanot Chananim. We'll be back here at 1.30 for the third and last session about coping with COVID uh, strategies for the day after. And then we'll uh, return the broadcast. Thank you.